Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lectora Live, your inside track into Lectora. Here we are. This is, I think it's a 15th show. I don't know. We've done a lot of shows already, and we're getting more lined up. And today we've got a second again. He's been on once before. He's on again. I'll introduce him in a moment. Here we go. And we are back, and I'm joined today by Sergei Snegarev. He is the president of Branch Track, branchtrack.com, and uh, he's joining us for the second time. I had the pleasure of working with him at DevLearn in the Trivantis booth just about two and a half weeks ago, and that was a lot of fun meeting him in person. And here we go. Sergei, how are you today? Hi, uh, how are you? I'm uh, really great, really excited. For, the, uh, for for the second time. Yeah. So so what was your experience like working in the Trivantis booth and getting to show Branch Track and, and just meeting everybody? Oh, well, that was definitely exciting. Uh, frankly, I haven't done a lot of shows in my life. Uh, my first job actually was a conference organizer, so I know how it works, but I've never been on the exhibitor side. And uh, this opportunity to spend two days with the Lectora team, talking up people, uh, trying to push a little bit of Lectora products, a little bit of course meal products, and of course, a little bit of branch track products as well. That was fun. Um, of course, spending two days on my feet wasn't that much fun, <laughs> but otherwise that was pretty great. I think I've done um, about one branch track presentation for every Lectora presentation. And uh, I think that was pretty unique for Lectora as well, because I don't think many other exhibitors had uh, uh, real customers and users on their booth to serve as a living testimony of kind. So uh, I think it was good for everybody and it was good fun, especially outside of the show. We were in Las Vegas after all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see now, now Las Vegas is not my favorite city. So, uh, but how, how did you feel your first time in Vegas? Uh, I was, uh, well, I don't know. On, on one hand, it all looks a little bit surreal. Everything mm -hmm. is a little bit like in the movies. You know, it, yep. it feels like you're walking through a uh, set on, on, on uh, Hollywood uh, grounds because everything is a little bit uh, unreal, a little bit plasticky, and uh, everything is a little bit Ocean's Eleven. But then when you get the hang of it, I think, you know, in a couple of days in, uh, I, I was really having a lot of fun. I actually planned my journey so that I have uh, two full days after the show to enjoy Vegas. And I think that was one of the best things I could do this year. I went to a David Copperfield show. That ah. was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I went in for a poker tournament. I actually went in for a craps lesson and play a little bit of craps. Now that game is not a mystery to me anymore. <laughs> I think I think I had good fun, and I actually I think I uh, left Vegas uh, cash positive, which oh, is that's good. Uh, that is a good thing. Yeah, most people don't really leave cash positive as much as they want to make believe they do. Um, so here, so, so here. But uh, I think I was about uh, twenty dollars up or something. And surprisingly, not thanks to my blackjack or poker skills, uh, of which there are none, but uh, thanks to just <laughs> blind luck uh, on my last day in slots. <laughs> That's it. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's an interesting place. It is an interesting place. Uh, they do a lot of conferences in Las Vegas. Not my favorite place to go. I, I, if I can avoid Vegas, I will. Um, I, I, I think living in California, I'm so used to not smelling smoke anymore that when I go there, it's like my head hurts. But Yes, um, I, I know. I know what you mean. That was the worst part of Vegas, frankly, because yeah. uh, here in Europe, smoking is banned pretty much everywhere. Is it really? So that, hmm. Yes, uh, you can't smoke in public places, not even on bus stops and so on. That's so, changed. And in Vegas, the second you walk out the uh, airport terminal onto the street, and it's, it's like smog, not, yeah. not just... Mm -hmm. 
uh, people smoking, but uh, it, it's really difficult to breathe. And in some places it was really unpleasant. I'm, I'm not a smoker myself, um, but uh, that was a bit surprising. It takes a bit getting used to. I never it, take it smoking does. rooms in hotels, so having that around was uh, was not fun. But uh, otherwise, uh, I, also part of the atmosphere, literally. It is. Now, I do love the architecture, the, the massiveness of the buildings, the lights. It's very, it's very nice from that point of view. I just don't care for it. Um, so it's, it's an interesting show. The show was busy. I didn't think it was as busy as it could be. Um, I didn't see that much traffic in the expo hall like I've seen in other ones. And I think partly because it was outdoors, you had to go outside of the main building. And people are funny. They don't like to go outside when it's 100 degrees. <laughs> so. uh, no, no, they don't. And I think it was a very weird decision by the organizers to actually have the conference part in uh, mm -hmm. one building and uh, expo yeah. in, in another building. So yeah. they had to lure the uh, attendees into the expo hall with free lunch, literally. And I, yeah. I think that did impact the footfall. And uh, uh, there were times when it was uh, a little bit too quiet. But uh, generally, I think, you know, we, we got a couple of hundred leads and I personally had a very a um, couple of very, very positive conversations with prospects. So That's good. I think it, it worked for me, at least. That's good. So, Sergey, you and I have a new thing that we're going to be doing. We both got invited into the Lectorum Advisory Board. So I yes, am yes, definitely looking Congrats. forward to that. Um, frankly, uh, I'm not sure how much we can talk about it. We've uh, both just signed the non-disclosure agreement, but uh, I'm personally very much excited to uh, have this opportunity to give direct feedback to the development team and to the managers. And uh, I don't think that many companies do that. Um, at least I haven't heard that uh, a lot of companies invite uh, power users and uh, customers to actually join in the conversation like right. that. What's your experience with that? Uh, about the same. Some of them do that. For, for about a decade, I was on the um, Captivate Advisory Board for Adobe. Captivate. But it wasn't a very active board, and they never listened to us, so it was, <laughs> it was, it was interesting. But, I, um, I can imagine. Yeah, but I don't know. Some companies do, some don't. Some don't. I, I think when a company does, it's a very good sign because they do want feedback. They want, they want to improve the product in every which way. And, and Lectora is already a very good product. So this is, to me, a very good sign that they're constantly looking to improve it a little bit better. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's a daunting task, frankly, when you have a product that big to keep improving that, especially when you always have this pressure from uh, the management to invent new features that will sell, 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 uh, whereas you still have to find resources to work on the existing features and functionality. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really a huge job they're doing, and I think they're doing it quite well. Yeah. So, so tell me, What's new with Branch Track and and other things you're doing? Uh, well, I'm essentially doing um, uh, two important things. I'm uh, helping run an uh, e-learning development company that I still own, and uh, it's uh, actively developing uh, a new customer base uh, in in Northern Europe, in Sweden, Germany, and we recently got our first American client. Uh, which you probably know. I know it's you. I've heard of them. So uh, that them. was that was pretty exciting. Uh, on uh, on the side of branch track, uh, I think the biggest news, uh, except the DevLearn trip, is that we have been shortlisted for the e-learning awards. Oh, good. It's a pretty big thing for us. Uh, it, it's uh, hosted by the Learning Performance Institute in. Uh, London and I had my first presentation as a shortlisted company. I had to fly to London to give this uh, half hour talk on what we do and why we do it and why BrainStrack is the most innovative tool of 2015. 
uh, that's the name of the category that mm -hmm. uh, we're shortlisted under. I had to actually take a break from my uh, vacation to fly there, so it was it was fun to have something uh, business minded in the middle of my vacation, and I think it went well. Uh, but we'll only know the results on November 25th when uh, they host this black tie event when uh, they open the golden envelope and mm. uh, they announce the winner. So I'm going to be there and uh, well, let's see. Frankly, so, I'm absolutely so meet... sure that we are the most innovative tool of 2015. That's great. Now, did you meet Colin Steed? Uh, no, he was not on the jury panels, uh, not one of the jurors, but I will definitely meet Colin in uh, November. He's a, he's a new friend. I like Colin a lot. Very nice person. So I heard. So I heard. He's going to be on the show maybe in a two or three weeks. Again, so we're going to be talking about some of the learning trends he's seeing from the show he runs. Um, he does a yearly show. And so we'll see what what he thinks is new upcoming and everything else um but very nice person i like him a lot so the the category of branch track is standalone it's also an embedded product now we are using branch track at one of our clients and we're using it in the embedded format within lectora which runs Pretty darn well, very very well. In fact, what 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 new things are happening with Branch Track that that you're looking to right now? Well, um, as you say, it's uh, an embeddable product, so it works very well with Lectura and other e-learning tools. So we decided that we are going to be friendly to other developers uh, from mm -hmm. the get-go. So uh, we don't want to push anyone out of the learning space. Uh, we just want to be another tool in the toolkit that an e-learning developer wants to have. And um, in terms of new functionality, I think the biggest part uh, is that a new mobile player is coming. Uh, previously, branch track simulations or branch track scenarios, they worked very well on uh, tablets, but they were just a little bit too small on the phones. And if you rotate the phone uh, in portrait mode, as most people use it, then uh, it, they were really kind of smallish. And um, now we are going to launch a whole new player with better 508 support, and it will work flawlessly in all device modes on uh, small screens and also will work better on tablets as well. Uh, it's uh, suddenly it, it turned out to be a very large endeavor technically because we are now have to rewrite a lot of code, mm -hmm. but uh, it's really important. We see a lot of companies switching to uh, mobile devices, especially in the uh, sales and customer service ser um, areas because uh, most of salespeople are always on the go and they have to have access to their training on uh, mobile devices. So we're trying to catch up with that. Uh, it's easier for us than for some other developers because BranchTrack uh, is a very new product. We only launched uh, about uh, 18 months ago. So uh, everything has been built without flash, with mobile devices in mind, with the latest technology. So it's a uh, relatively easy transition, but still a lot of work. So I think we're going to launch this new mobile player in a few weeks. Now, we've all seen what Lectora is doing with the responsive course design. That's going to be one of the new features coming up. They've been doing demos of it uh, quite a bit. Uh, are you incorporating any of those features into Branch Track? It sounds like you might be. Um, well, frankly, Lectora's launch of responsive course design, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, the upcoming feature in Lectora where you can uh, uh, build separate layout for your course aimed at different devices from uh, small screen phones to tablets to desktop PCs. And Lectora will take care of uh, scaling up or down of, of your content. It's, uh, it, it's a pretty exciting functionality and uh, it's uh, pretty unique. I think only Captivate has something like that in mm -hmm. stock and most other tools have nothing like that. So the launch of that functionality has been uh, an inspiration for us. We understand that a lot of people use BranchTrack as uh, an interaction embedded into Lectora, 
which is easy to do. And if Lector is coming to mobiles uh, for good, then we should support that as well. Uh, the way that branch track works is different. Uh, it's much more automated because uh, we are not a full-blown authoring tool where you start with a blank canvas like an Lector and then you can do whatever you want. We are what what I call a content-centric tool. So uh, essentially what the developer does is uh, to provide content, one thing that we can't do, you know, to create the content of the scenario. And we take care of the template, of the layout on different devices and so on. So you don't have to actually do much development or, or God forbid, coding. So uh, our approach is different from Lectoris, but we're following in the footsteps uh, and uh, I think we'll launch it about the same time as Lectora RCD launches. I hear it's uh, going to be around in November. That's what I heard. That'll be good. Now, you have quite an interesting honor with Trivantis. You are the most prolific person on the community forum. <laughs> uh, uh, I probably am the person with most uh, free time on their hands <laughs> because uh, when, when I need to escape my emails, I don't go to Facebook. I rather go to the community and check out what uh, what people are talking about, what's uh, the latest uh, uh, I know uh, question they might have, and I get my kicks from helping people. You know, just makes me feel. Uh, uh, you know, a little bit better about myself, frankly, uh, when I can help someone to achieve something faster. So um, probably that's that's why I'm probably more motivated and I have time to do that. I'm sure there are my, many more people who uh, could contribute uh, in, in many ways to the community, but uh, they might be a little bit too busy to do that. <laughs> now, of, of the work you've done on the community, are there any trends that you see in terms of questions people ask things that they either get more stuck in or or they feel they need more help in um, it's difficult to say uh, what i can say for sure is that i don't see a lot of people asking very simple questions uh, hmm. Probably that's because Lectora has been around for quite some time, so they had the chance to uh, iron out everything related to you know, new user onboarding. Their training is excellent. It's uh, pretty easy to catch up with the tool because uh, if you know PowerPoint or you know Word, Lectora is easy for you. Uh, most people ask really difficult questions. So instead of, uh, let's say, how do I embed a video on a page, uh, I would encounter questions like, how do I create a button that jumps 10 seconds uh, ahead? Mm -hmm. Or how do I make sure that when I return to the page, the video is bookmarked and uh, uh, resumes from uh, where I left it? And, and so on and so on. So pretty advanced questions. And uh, it's pretty fun to dig into the coding of Lectora to try and play with, around with different functionality and uh, see if I can actually solve that problem. You know, one of the, I, one of the things I really find with Lectora that I've always enjoyed from, from the beginning is the amount of power you have through actions or group actions that, or action groups, that can really allow you to do almost anything without having to be a programmer. Well, uh, my problem is that I am a programmer. <laughs> I know how to code in uh, JavaScript. So, mm -hmm. uh, and you know what they say? It's uh, uh, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> so if you know JavaScript, it seems to be the easiest uh, yeah. shortcut to any solution. So uh, I think the breakthrough for me was uh, at uh, two years ago at Lectora User Conference when I saw someone build a whole Space Invaders game in mm. Lectora without using any JavaScript. It was only based on actions and variables and conditional actions mm. and so on and so on. It's a massive project and it works really well and there is not a single byte of uh, JavaScript in Interesting. it. Interesting. And uh, this is when I started thinking that, uh, you know, I should probably 
give actions a little bit more love. So every time <laughs> I respond to someone on the community now, I try to stop myself from just uh, giving them the code, but uh, I try to come up with a way to achieve the same thing with the actions because it will be easier for them. And uh, it's also a little bit more challenging uh, uh, for me because I have to change my uh, mindset uh, to do that. But actions and uh, grouped actions and variables and conditions are really powerful mm -hmm. and you can achieve a lot with that. So I'm trying to teach myself that a little bit. Yeah. What, what do you see as the one of the most powerful features of Lectora? Uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, difficult to say. Uh, we were talking about that during DevLearn, uh, seeing all those people coming to the booth and talking about different features. Everyone has a different set of requirements. Someone likes the fact that Lectora is uh, HTML5, uh, not just compatible, it's all HTML5. There is no flash in it at all. Some people like the fact that there is an online version that you can run on Mac or you can share between several people without having to reinstall in different PCs. Uh, some people like uh, something completely different. Um, so uh, for me, it's always been the fact that you can incorporate anything into Lectora. Mm -hmm. If you like Captivate and you like building software simulations in Captivate, it's easy to bring them into Lectora, wrap them into Lectora, and uh, then uh, have all the power of, um, let's say, actions or HTML or whatever have you. Uh, added to it so you can concentrate on what other tools do best and then bring it all into Lectora because it's so powerful to encompass everything and then you have the best of all the tools. If you try to bring some external content into um, some of those other tools uh, it, it'll be just painful and Lectora does that very well. We used to call Lectora the great container because every, exactly. you can exactly. put everything into it and and for the most part, it works. No no real issues. Um, and like you said, with JavaScript, you can communicate with all the internals pretty easily. Yeah, absolutely. Now, explain a little bit the difference between branch track as an online software as a service versus as an embedded uh, piece of software. Well, um, essentially, BranchTrack is just a website. If you go to branchtrack.com, the name, it's easy to remember, branch for branching scenarios and track for tracking the learning outcomes. So branchtrack.com, you register, you get the editor right there. Um, you just register, you literally fill out a couple of uh, uh, fields and you have yourself a 14-day trial. Um, then everything you do is online, like in Google Docs, for example, and uh, everything you produce can either be hosted online on our, on our server or it can be downloaded. Uh, either way, you can take the uh, output of BrainStrack, take the actual working scenario that includes images and media, graphics, videos, uh, voiceover, and bring it into any other tool. For Lectura, we even have the special option to export the library object so that it's a single file that you can drop onto a Lectura page and it will automatically um, set up itself as an embedded external HTML object with all the resources attached, with uh, all the dimensions set for you and so on. So it's easy to embed. But there is the next level of uh, using the tool. It's uh, when it's actually, the whole tool is embedded into your e-learning authoring tool. Right now, there are a couple of uh, uh, web-based authoring tools that have that option and uh, hopefully someday Lectora will have that as well where you just click a button inside Lectora and the whole branch track editor interface pops up right in front mm -hmm. of you similarly to what they have with uh, e-learning brothers now mm -hmm. so they obviously have the technology we just have to see if uh, there are enough people excited about branch track and using Lectora to have that functionality developed we'll see that sounds good. And, um, and, and as a customer, and we, we are using the embedded version of it. And, and frankly, it's pretty easy to use. With a couple of calls, we can figure out what variables are what 
and react accordingly. Very, very easy. Yeah, it's uh, um, been the principle of BrainStrack to be very friendly to other authoring tools. So uh, BrainStrack scenario doesn't just sit on your page or in your slide. Uh, it actually actively talks to the parent wrapper or to the great container, as you put mm -hmm. it, <laughs> and uh, reports uh, uh, how much points the learner scored uh, within the scenario. Uh, whether the scenario has been completed in its entirety or which specific scene the learner is uh, currently in. So uh, we can push that data into the variables within Lectura and then it's up to you to use those values to maybe build your own branching, maybe show more feedback and uh, uh, send those learners who fail back to the beginning of the chapter and uh, if uh, a person scores high enough to take that score and combine it with the quiz score and send it into the LMS, Victoria is pretty great at uh, playing around with variables and scores like that. So you can take almost any number and submit it to the LMS. And BrainStrack exposes this information to you so you can uh, build on top of it. We actually love the fact that uh, people use Range track in conjunction with other tools uh, because it just gives them more power as educators, as instructional designers. So uh, it, it helps them build better training and we take credit for it. <laughs> Speaking of better training, you've seen a lot of e-learning. You've seen uh, the trends as they've been emerging over the last several years. What do you see as one of the most promising emerging trends within e-learning, as well as what are some of the deficiencies you see in e-learning? Wow, that's a big question, but uh, I like to compare e-learning to web design. Um, if you remember in 1990s, uh, everyone thought that web page is just a gimmick. You know, some companies uh, thought they need to have it, but uh, they, uh, prioritized having uh, having been listed in uh, yellow pages uh, far above having a website. Uh, and then it changed when someone suddenly thought that, wow, everyone has to have a website and everyone has it, so we should have it. And uh, everyone rushed to build one. And that was the golden age for web developers <laughs> because uh, you couldn't build a website yourself. You had to hire a professional to do that. And it it, it was pretty an expensive uh, endeavor. And uh, then everything changed again. Uh, suddenly, it's easy to build websites using WordPress, all those templates. It's easy to host thanks to companies like Amazon or GoDaddy. And uh, everything is just easy. You just provide content and everything kind of uh, is, is built for you. It's easy to build a website. And now we are witnessing the fourth stage where no one cares about websites anymore. Again, yeah. uh, everyone cares whether you're listed on uh, Facebook, whether you have an Instagram profile, um, whether you're blogging, whether you're producing content and sharing it on LinkedIn. And uh, I think e-learning is following the same pattern. It started as almost a gimmick. You know, why would we have e-learning? We have such wonderful trainers and who wants to kind of use those bulky CDs with video lectures and, and so on. And uh, then it moved to the stage where everyone understood that e-learning uh, has all those advantages of cost saving, of uh, uh, rapid deployment, of uh, uh, being very flexible, uh, being adaptive and so on and so on. But you would need a professional e-learning developer to build that. I think we're in the end of this stage right now where companies hire uh, e-learning development companies and e-learning developers to build training. Uh, it's becoming much easier now to just provide content and it will be built for you uh, using templates, using uh, tools that are smart and sophisticated enough to adapt to whatever device or layout or purpose you want to use it for. Uh, all you have to do is to add that content. And uh, to continue this analogy, I'm foreseeing the fourth stage uh, in a few years as well. Whereas 
no one will care about e-learning, about uh, e-learning courses as we know them now. Everyone will care whether you have shared enough information about your products on your internal Wikipedia page or Wikipedia uh, system, whether you have created enough apps for your employees to tap into and use as job aids, whether you have enabled your management and employees and advisors and supervisors to talk to each other online in uh, uh, corporate social networks and so on and so on. No one will really care about e-learning courses. No one will have time to take courses. They will uh, look for quick solutions uh, uh, at, at their fingertips. We're not there yet. There are not many solutions for that, but I think uh, this is the trend and we've already witnessed it in web design, and I'm sure it will happen the same way in uh, e-learning as well. So, bad news for the e-learning developers, you'll be out of job uh, <laughs> five, ten years for sure. Maybe, maybe. Hard to say, hard to say. These industries don't move that fast sometimes. I keep laughing every time I hear e-learning people saying, it's a new industry. Well, it's only been around 40 years, but um, it's it's... Every, every year there's more capability, not necessarily with all the tools, but with the with the speed of computers, the internet, everything else. So in that respect, it's newer, but it's not new. So it's interesting. Well, here's a fun fact. Uh, the word e-learning, uh, as we know it, uh, originated in 1999. Mm -hmm. Before that, everyone knew it as uh, computer-based training. Right. I don't think anyone calls it CBT anymore. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, it's relatively new and it's changing. And you know what scares me is that the pace of that change is increasing every year. That's true. That's true. And I keep choking that, you know, we're in e-learning now. What's next? F-learning? Uh, oh, yeah, maybe. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, maybe we'll see Z-learning at some point. Yeah. You know, one of the trends I see a lot is video, 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 video. Everything's becoming video because it's very engaging. And, and in many ways, video is cheaper than doing a lot of graphics or animations, uh, especially in a lot of the things we do. It could be very, very useful from scenarios to, um, to just creating a story. And that's, that's I, I would say, that's probably the weakest area of e-learning, the story, or lack thereof. Um, and, and that's partly a result of a lot of instructional designers not being storytellers. They're not taught to write. They're taught to design curriculums. It's very different. Yes, I think e-learning has always been a very technical area. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, naturally, people with more kind of uh, technical mindset gravitated yep. towards it because you have to have technical mindset mm -hmm. to dig through learning platforms, authoring tools, uh, third party solutions, uh, SCORM and protocols and HTML and mobile devices and so on and so on. Even if you're just an instructional designer focused on content, you have to understand those technologies to know your limitations. So uh, those natural born storytellers uh, I don't think there are a lot of those in e-learning. And uh, this is why I think uh, uh, it's important to, to see that fourth stage of, of e-learning development where uh, the technicalities will, will just disappear. It will be all about who generates more exciting content that people mm -hmm. want to listen to uh, without uh, thinking too much about how it's going to be delivered. Right. Computers will take care of it. But uh, you're absolutely right, we don't see enough uh, storytellers. No, so a, a lot of things are out of context, and that's where I think the training falls in many cases. Without context, most people don't know how it applies to them. Uh, yeah. I see that a lot in corporate training. Yeah, uh, one thing that uh, I, I learned quite early on, uh, it's from uh, Surprisingly, it's from two people that uh, uh, created uh, South Park. Yeah. You know, South Park, the mm -hmm. offensive, hilarious cartoon. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the guys, the directors, they were talking about uh, storytelling. And they told that 
uh, bad storytelling uses a lot of commas and ands. So mm -hmm. you tell one thing, another thing, and then another thing, and then another thing, and then another thing and then something else. And that's just bad storytelling. And this is exactly how most e-learning courses are structured. But uh, good storytelling is based around words like therefore, because of that, and also this uh, cool part of meanwhile, back at the farm or mm -hmm. back at the ranch. If you tell a story in a place where one part happens because of the other part and therefore it leads to the third part. Meanwhile, and then we circle back to the general principle of what we're trying to convey, you, you just create a much more immersive story. And sure. uh, it's easy to use that kind of uh, template, uh, even with the same materials that you have. Just try to find that logical order of things. Try to find that because of and therefore part of your narration, instead of just listing, dumping that content on the learner. And um, I think that uh, behind all those technicalities, uh, e-learning developers don't always have time to do that, or maybe uh, uh, energy to do that. Uh, so uh, I'm really uh, waiting for those times when technicality is gone out of e-learning and it's all about content. This is one of the things we're trying to achieve with BrainStrike as well. Uh, there's very little technicality to it. It's all based on the story you want to tell, mm -hmm. the branching story. Right, and in, in essence, something like BrainStrike kind of adheres to the Socratic approach where a question begets another question, eventually you get to an answer. But if you don't ask a question, or if you're not sure what to ask, or if you give somebody the answer immediately, do they learn? Probably not. Um, no, so it helps to no. keep the dialogue. Uh, yes, uh, well, I never thought about it as uh, Socratic, but uh, you're probably right, because uh, uh, what I see a lot of people do on branch track is to create those uh, fake branching scenarios mm -hmm. where uh, there is no branching. There is a few reply choices that, uh, or a few ways that you can try to explore, but all of those wrong ways are labeled as wrong and they're blocked off by feedback of right. don't do that. <laughs> and then there's only one correct path that lets you move to the next uh, step in the branching scenario where you're presented with more choices and only one of those choices is correct and all other choices are blocked off with feedback. No, we don't do that. And right. instead of uh, being immersed and engaged into a branching story where you want to explore and see the outcomes and see what happens in that story, you're being pushed down this corridor with a lot of locked doors and alarms mm -hmm. around you, and, and you're running and hating towards the end, trying to get out of all uh, the whole exercise in, instead of actually learning. So what I encourage people to do is to let people, we're talking adults here, let people see the consequences of their choices. Mm -hmm. So branching is, is really easy. You create a challenge, you give people a choice how to act within that challenge, and then you let them see the consequences of their choices and understand uh, the gravity of, of their choices instead of telling them that this works and this doesn't work. This right. is not how adults learn, but this is how most e-learning is designed. And that really breaks my heart. And this is one of the things that we try to design brain strike against. And still, I see a lot of people do sure. that. So we try to educate sure. them in a friendly yeah, well manner. One of the things we've done for years, and more, more often than not, they don't let us do it. I like to put out a question right at the beginning of something I know they don't know. But I want to see how they react to the problem and how they try to solve it. And they may solve it incorrectly, or at least partially correctly. You know, that's where Branch Track could come in handy, where you have, you don't have to give them a right or wrong you have different degrees of right or wrong and you may have something terrible they did a completely wrong thing but if they don't try they'll never learn that's a little more real world 
Yes, exactly. This is uh, this is how people learn in real world, uh, but it's really expensive <laughs> to do that in right. real world and let people try and see the consequences. Uh, you know, we don't well, have to talk uh, air traffic controllers here. Right. Anyone, even a salesperson uh, playing around mm -hmm. with the cash register will get you in trouble. But yep. uh, uh, it's it's e-learning. You can do whatever you want. You can let people break things, and uh, somehow we don't. And that's sad. A part of the problem might be that in, in a lot of corporations, you have limited time for them to sit in front of a computer and learn something. You, if, you, if they're on the phones, you have to take them away from the phones. If they're meeting with clients, you have to take them away with clients. So you don't always have the time you want to be able to train correctly. That's one of the issues. Um, but if we did, it would, I think, make for a, a better learning experience. Um, and I don't I, think I don't think gamification is the solution. Maybe elements of game design, yes, but more often than not, like you said, we guide them through the right answer. So I think that's uh, that's where we come back to the storytelling part because mm -hmm. uh, if if you look at anyone, even the most even the busiest employees, like people in call centers who who really uh, are hitting the phone all the time, um, they do have time to play Angry Birds on mm -hmm. uh, on the bus or you know in a, in, in in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they do have time to uh, read a fun story on, on an entertainment website or on a news website. Uh, they have time to uh, enjoy a TV show. Uh, why? Because all of those things uh, have good stories behind them. They have those elements of game design often as well. And uh, uh, it's especially true of, of normal office employees, uh, you know, who statistically work anywhere between two and four hours a day of real work, and the rest is just fillers, you know, browsing Facebook if you have a chance, or, you know, texting your friends uh, from a personal phone and, and so on. So uh, in those less productive times, uh, they choose to do something which is never e-learning, and uh, this is the challenge. We have to design e-learning so that it's compelling enough to lure them away from, uh, you know, those funny websites or, or Angry Birds or whatever e-magazine or, or whatever right. ask people. So it's, uh, it's a challenge, but uh, this is how e-learning should be. Otherwise, it will never work and we'll have to use the stick, not the carrot, to push people into it and lure them with fake stuff like badges and uh, leaderboards yep. and, mm -hmm. and all, all, that, all that stuff that, as you said, doesn't really work because it's fake. It's right. putting lipstick on a boring story. Instead, you should just make the story uh, be compelling. Right, right. Sergey, are you doing any webinars, any talking, any trade shows in the near future people can meet you at? Well, uh, I met uh, uh, Scott Bartnett in uh, DevLearn in mm -hmm. uh, Las Vegas. He is the new marketing director of uh, Trident. Vice, Vice President. All the products. Um, I'm not good with uh, titles. <laughs> Vice President. Good for you, Scott. Uh, but uh, I know he's the senior marketing person in the whole company, mm -hmm. and he is one of the uh, most exciting people to talk to about marketing. He has an enormous amount of ideas, and we talked a lot about all the things that uh, could be done for Triventus and for Lictor in the webinar space in terms of competitions, in terms of challenges, in terms of enabling the community to share stuff, uh, in terms of people sharing their work in progress uh, to get opinions from their peers. In, he has a million of ideas, so I really hope that uh, at least some of those ideas will uh, soon come to life. And uh, they do involve webinars, so hopefully uh, we'll have a few topics to talk about. We had an excellent webinar with Triventis uh, in spring uh, dedicated to branching scenarios. Mm -hmm. it, uh, we, I don't think we even touched branch track at all. We just talked about uh, branching scenarios mm -hmm. as an approach in instructional design. And we had an excellent webinar on uh, visual design, on minimalist design. I come from Northern Europe. 
and uh, Swedish minimalism is a very powerful visual philosophy that I try to expose people to, to inspire them. And uh, I have more topics like that uh, scheduled for the rest of the year and for the next year. And uh, with Scott's support, I think we will be able to do that and more. I, I think Lictor is in for a wonderful ride marketing-wise. And everyone who loves Lictor should be very, very excited about uh, Scott taking this position. I agree. I agree. And, and he's a nice guy too. Smart and nice. One of the nicest people I've met. Yeah. I agree. And he's our neighbor. He's not too far from us. So that's always fun. Um, yeah, he's, he, uh, he's from LA, I think. Uh, I uh, like no, he's Santa Barbara. Victoria Santa Barbara. A... Very close to us. Okay, I see even that even that close. Yeah. So uh, what I like about uh, Triventis is that it's uh, uh, such a distributed company that, uh, you know, you have the best well, that Triventis have the best talent from uh, all over the place, mm -hmm. not just uh, Florida or not just Ohio. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a company that's uh, entirely American. Like everyone who works for the company is right there within a couple of time zones. And uh, whenever you reach out to them through the community or directly, uh, there is a chance that uh, 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 you will meet the CTO or the VP of marketing mm -hmm. or one of the developers directly you know you never go through support guys uh, you always talk to the people behind the product and i think that's unique and that's uh, something that lector don't talk about uh, that often but uh, you don't have that with other tools or other learning platforms right. uh, you always have this uh, you know uh, remote support call centers uh, that you have to go through before some developer takes your call reluctantly and so on with Lector, it's entirely different experience, and I think they should uh, um, talk about this a little bit more. I think this is one of their uh, strongest sides. It's a very good differentiator. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sergei, a pleasure having you on again. I'm glad you could make it today. And um, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Uh, well, you can comment right under this video. If uh, you're on YouTube or you're watching this on the community, I'm uh, monitoring these things, so I will notice. Uh, you can also go to brainstrike.com and get in touch through the website, uh, hello at brainstrike.com, or uh, Sergey, but you know it's hard to spell, so hello at brainstrike.com. I uh, will make sure to get that email. And uh, of course, there's Triventis community. If you want to reach out through that to me or to anyone else, there's a lot of people who are willing to help, uh, including uh, the new community manager, right? Sounds great. Well, we are at the end of our time. Thank you much again for being on today. Good luck with Branch Track and all the things you're doing. And good luck with the awards in November. Hope that uh, that turns out for you. Thank and, you. I'm holding my fingers crossed. Yep. And uh, for all you people watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Give us your feedback. Uh, we definitely will keep an eye on it too and get back with you. Have a good one, everyone. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.